quarter or two, but I think it'll be fine. Yeah. So it seems that we are now going live. So that's the typical 30 seconds that we'll be waiting until I kick off officially the show. And we should be almost live. So welcome to the ones who are joining now. And we are live. So welcome to the Scale Up Valley community. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Today, it's a very special episode of the Scale Up Valley podcast. And we'll have a CEO interview uh, with John Meadows, the co-founder and CEO of Bowery Valuation. John, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And yeah, it would be great to, to know a little bit more about your background uh, um, and uh, what is Powery Valuation. Yeah, no, thanks so much for having me. I really, really do appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I, Powery Valuation is, a, is a, the, the first truly modern commercial real estate appraiser. Um, most of our listeners probably have not are not familiar with commercial appraisals or don't know it too intimately. Right. Um, I certainly was not when I found myself falling into this industry right out of college. Um, so back in 2011, I was graduating from Penn. I had thoughts of going to law school most of my time in college. Uh, my parents are both lawyers. And I think late junior year in college, I was thinking about starting to study for the LSAT. And, and I had a conversation with my, my dad and um, he said to me, like, look, your sister has wanted to be a doctor every single day since she was nine years old. That is not you with wanting to be a lawyer. You're 22 years old. Careers are very, very long. I've been a lawyer for 45 years. I'm not sitting here. You know, I've had a great career, but I'm not sitting here regretting not having done it for 48 years. Um, so, you know, I was always very much a generalist in school and, and, and kind of wasn't sure ever what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and law made sense. I did debate undergrad uh, in high school and I studied U.S. history undergrad. And, um, and so kind of that conversation really recalibrated my thinking about my career and, and shifted me back towards a, a very large unknown. Um, I grew up in California and then went to school in Philadelphia and, and used to visit New York City all the time. And so what I really wanted at that point was to move to New York. That was something that in my early 20s was something that was very, very high in my priority list. So I started thinking about, you know, professions and, uh, or jobs and startups and, you know, management consulting, things like that. I was kind of trying to avoid the finance route. A lot of my friends from school were going down the investment <laughs> banking path. That didn't appeal to me. Um, right. And I get a call very, very early my senior year in college from a buddy of mine who was here above me. And uh, he said, look, I'm, I'm recruiting for this commercial real estate company in New York City. And my boss has kind of tasked me with, with hiring like two or three guys to fill out, you know, the, the next, the next class year, it was a 20 person company. So a relatively small company, but at the time was the largest um, independent commercial real estate appraisal firm in New York. I knew nothing about real estate really going in um, <laughs> I was taking an, a modern architecture class at the time. And that was pretty much the extent of my real estate knowledge from that, that course uh, when I got that phone call and uh, I came up to New York to interview and, and the owner's pitch to us was, I know this is probably not your lifelong dream as a young boy growing up in California to become a commercial real estate appraiser, but it is, it's an incredible foundational education to get in business and finance um, and you know, client service and also kind of fundamentally in real estate. And what the appraisal is, is at, at, the, at any commercial loan that's larger than $500,000, um, it's required to get this, this appraisal. And it's the most thorough analysis of value in all of commercial real estate. So these reports are typically over 100 pages long, defending and explaining why a property is worth what it's worth. Um, and that comes at the end of the lending process. And it's ultimately kind of this check to make sure that, that these loans that are being made are appropriate and reasonable. And so, you know, his pitch to us is if you can understand the value, truly value every commercial real estate asset in the largest market, the largest real estate market in the country. And every single day you're meeting and, and speaking with brokers, with owners, with lenders, developers. Uh, that's, that's an education that's very, very rare. 
And there's not a lot of young people going into this industry and getting that education. And from there, there's so many things you can do. And so it really was a very real pitch. And it's, it's the same pitch um, on top of a few other things that, that we make to, to new associates that we're recruiting for our company. Um, and it was true. I mean, the, the two guys who are a year above me at Penn that, that recruited me, one went to Harvard to get his master's in real estate finance, one went to MIT to get his master's, and, and they went on to work for big developers. And so the, the education component was very, very real. Um, on the flip side, when I got into the space, six months in, I actually recruited my best friend from growing up, Noah, who is now my co-founder. And uh, when, when we found ourselves walking into the commercial real estate appraisal industry back in 2011, um, it felt like we were stepping out of a time machine in 1985. You know, we'd grown up in the Bay Area, surrounded by technology our entire lives. And then we found ourselves in this industry where, you know, the, the most innovative tools that existed to do our jobs, which is, you know, produce these 100 plus page reports were Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel. And there was nothing else. And that is not just at our 20 person company in New York City or your, you know, individual sole proprietor out of Long Island, that's the case for the largest players in our space as well. Um, the CPREs and Cushman Wakefields of the world, these are multi-billion dollar companies and their valuation teams have the same tools that we had and that everyone else in the industry has, which is Excel and Word. And so for us, you know, every single day we're coming to work and spending four or five hours a day doing manual busy work, essentially data entry, um, formatting photos, transcribing scribbled notes on a notepad from inspecting a property into like full narrative building descriptions, um, opening up 50 Excel sheets of past reports we'd written or our colleagues had written looking for expense comps that were kind of already in like buried as, as dark data essentially and not accessible in any sort of structured way. Um, printing up sales reports from CoStar and writing up the same sales like in a grueling, extensive manner every single day that we've written up in the past, our colleagues have written up, but we're really not accessible in any meaningful way. And so, you know, we, we recognized pretty early on that in a world with cars that can drive themselves and, uh, you know, the level of technology that, that it, it surrounds us every single day and exists in our kind of modern world today, that Excel and Word that, you know, came out 30 years prior couldn't be the best solution for producing these reports that are absolutely crucial in the lending process and crucial to a to an industry that's actually, you know, our industry is about $4 billion but in, in annual revenues, but, you know, we power an industry that's over $200 billion. And so the fact that everyday appraisers are, are using these tools that result in not just uh, taking a really long time and, and being tedious on the appraiser, but producing a really inconsistent work product and, the, the quality of that appraisal and the accuracy of the numbers um, of all the, the language that, you know, defends and explains why a property is worth what it's worth is absolutely crucial. And so what we were doing was we're taking a template of a past appraisal we'd written. Um, so a, a Excel sheet with like 50 tabs and populated with data from not just one other report, but because these templates that used over and over, you know, countless other appraisals, numbers that that was where they're coming from, um, linked to this Word document, which is an appraisal written about a completely different building. Um, you know, also then a 120 page Word document filled with data about something that's not relevant at all to the appraisal you're currently writing. And trying to update those two things simultaneously with the amount of kind of manual work that goes into that leads to tremendous amounts of inconsistency um, and just a, a huge amount of errors that you see constantly in these appraisal reports. And so on the lending side, who are our clients, you know, banks, private lenders primarily, uh, the perception of the appraisal industry is typically, it's typically not held in, in the highest regard. And I think um, oftentimes seen as kind of a thorn in their side and an annoyance in the process. It, it really shouldn't be that. It, it should be a huge asset in terms of, you know, the level of expertise of the appraisers themselves, which is, which is really incredible. And um, so we've kind of taken the approach of, of not just trying to solve, you know, the issues that we saw, we saw through technology, but also really trying to create, you know, partnerships with our clients rather than just being seen as a vendor. And so um, back in 2015, we'd been there for about four years, you know, we had this idea to, to build our software. 
And it started with technology. You know, the, the main problem we saw in the space was the tech, obviously, and it's grown beyond that for us. But we, uh, the, the kind of, the final thing we needed to, to leave our, our old firm and, and, and start Bowery was, was to meet our co-founder. Um, you know, Noah and I are not engineers. And so we were trying to build something that had never existed and build it from scratch in um, kind of create the modern toolkit for appraisers. And so we met Arthur co-founder through a friend of mine from Penn. Um, you know, we talk to, to other founders all the time about, you know, especially non-technical founders, but, you know, the challenges of finding uh, a really great engineer to, to actually make their vision come true. And I've spoken to people that said like, we searched for six months, for a year or for two years. Um, we got unbelievably lucky. So this was to, to start a startup and to get, you know, from step one to two to three to you know, five, 10, and, and ultimately kind of have sustainable success. The, the, the number of times you need yeah. to get lucky uh, just build, builds and builds. And it's, <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Um, but this was, this was the kind of moment that we look back on that was really probably the defining moment for us. And, and that came at the very beginning, so, meeting so Caesar. Both of you, the, the, so you have three co-founders. That's, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the two of you were best friends, kind of grew up together uh, in the Bay Area. Then you moved to, to Penn to study, and now you are based in, in New York. And yep. when did you meet the first co-founder, which was the technical person, the engineering that was missing in the founding team? Yeah, so we kind of were finally at a point where, so appraisals are very complicated. So we needed to stay long enough to really understand the space and understand the, the mm -hmm. product reports. Um, and so after about four years, we felt like we were in a place where we had that knowledge base to build our dream software. And we also you know, quit our jobs and live in Manhattan for a sustainable <laughs> for <laughs> amount of time. So we needed a little bit of money. So it took a little time to, to create those savings. Yeah, uh, understand that, it. <laughs> that was interesting, 18 months for sure. And uh, so after we were kind of at that point, we felt like we were ready I reached out to a buddy of mine from Penn who I knew was an engineer um, and kind of Noah and I got coffee with him and we told him this idea that we had and asked him, you know, is this feasible, first of all, to build this? And do you know anyone your, yourself or, or do you know anyone that would want to do this with us? And he had a good job at the time and didn't have any sort of capacity to, to help us with it. But his girlfriend, um, was actually my now co-founder's best friend from Princeton. And so he's like, I, I can introduce you to, to Caesar. He takes side projects like this. He had a, his own development company. So he did kind of a combination of like contract work and, and, and side projects. So we met with Caesar, um, the first you know engineer that, that we really met with to kind of explain the concept that we had. And, and we showed him how we were doing things. And, and we kind of told him about the industry and how there's over $4 billion in annual revenues and, um, you know, kind of explaining the space. And then we kind of gave him this tour of, of our every day and kind of how we produce these reports. And he just said, like, I, I just can't believe you guys did this every day for four years. Like, this looks so painful. Um, okay. And his reaction was, I didn't know industries like this still existed. Like, I, I had no clue there were multi-billion dollar spaces that still remained this antiquated from a tech standpoint because he was kind of in his world, this bubble of, of engineering and, and people thinking through, you know, the next level of, of virtual reality and AI and machine learning. And yet there's industries like this still that are just totally built in, you know, essentially pen and paper or, or the kind of computer equivalent of, of right. word. Um, so this is yeah. back in 2015. And uh, we started started building software from there. And so started on a part-time basis in the, in the very beginning. And then when he kind of, you know, understood the opportunity that we had and, and what we were building and the excitement around it, he left that development firm where he actually had a 50% stake and took, took the risks with us and went all in. Um, and, and so that's how we became and, and founders. And this was in 2017, 2018? 2015. Um, and so we spent, so we spent about a year just building software, like bouncing around coffee shops in East village. Um, it was, it was a wild time to have gone from, you know, grinding from you know, 10 AM to midnight every day, 
writing, cranking out these appraisal reports to now, uh, you know, understanding building software for the first time. Noah and I had no experience in it. Caesar had no experience in appraisals. So in the beginning, like we were speaking totally different languages, but started to really kind of build that rapport and, and start to, to make some real progress. And uh, so then the next step for us was in the summer of 2016, um, through another friend of mine, I was introduced to one of the co-founders of this accelerator program in New York called Metaprop. Um, it was a real estate tech accelerator. And we were the first company, we were in their second class and you know, we were the first company they ever took that was pre-launch, pre-product being done, but they'd kind of seen every real estate tech startup that had been coming along in the last, I guess, previous five years. And, and they never seen anyone touching appraisals because we were really the first ones. And so we they took that class um, coming out of that program. We went out to raise a seed round of funding. So this was uh, kind of the start of that process was about 18 months after we'd started building the software. Um, spent a few months raising that initial seed round meeting with, I think we had like 60 VC meetings in two months in New York city. Um, so meeting with really just talking to anyone that would, that would take a meeting with us. And uh, so ultimately raised um, about $2 million. Uh, we, we'd previously raised a friend, friends and family round from a few friends from, of mine from school and from growing up. Um, and then this property owner up in the Bronx. Um, cool story there, actually. We, two of my best friends from college who initially invested in April of 2016. So we had like nowhere near a finished product. Our business plan was not even close to have worked out. And they took a chance on us. No. invested money and, and you know, they were 26 year old guys. Like they didn't have that much money at the time. Um, and they actually just sold half their shares and, and gave it all to charity. So um, we just kind of yesterday announced that, you know, I think $150,000 um, has just been donated to charity because of, because of what our team here has built, which is, which is pretty cool. But um, that was a side story. Yeah. Thanks. That was, that was a cool moment, but um, and also just those guys are incredible for doing that. So wanted to, to shout them out, but, um, but uh, yeah, so we raised a, a seed round of about $2 million, a seed round. A seed round yeah. In, uh, in May, 2017. And with that, we were able to actually launch our business. And so we needed, cause we're a vertically integrated appraisal firm. And so we're not selling technology. We use the technology internally and we produce the reports themselves uh, ourselves um, and so in order to do that, we needed to hire, you know, really experienced appraiser to, to head up our appraisal firm. Um, and so with that right. funding, um, brought over our chief appraiser and COO, James Dunn, who was a VP at CBRE previously. He'd been in commercial real estate in New York for 16 years. Um, and CBRE is the largest appraisal firm in our industry. And so the kind of brand behind him was, was crucial for us in the early days. Um, and so, you know, raised that seed round back in 2017, launched our business. Uh, you know, the early days were tough because we're trying to sell to, to banks and these are, you know, risk averse institutions as, as they should be. Right. Uh, and so, you know, taking a shot on a new appraisal firm is a tough, is, is, is a tough sell. But for us, um, you know, we had the benefit of, of having come from the industry ourselves, our you know, Noah, myself, James. And so we had a good number of relationships built up. Um, our investors had relationships in commercial real estate as well. And so uh, kind of finding various channels to get into the right person any way we could and just getting that meeting and kind of explaining how we're thinking about the space in a, in a new and unique way and, and why that's gonna impact their business in, in a really beneficial way as well. And so, um, you know, our pitch is like, we're gonna be delivering much higher quality reports faster and at a lower cost, like we're, we're checking all three boxes that, that you desire, because we now have not just the experience that, that you expect and you want, but now have technology to actually do this in a much more intelligent, much more efficient way. Um, and so started getting traction um, in you know, commercial real estate in the, in the appraisal world and, and building our business from there. And uh, about six months in, raise a, a, what we call a seed prime round. We raised about $5 million about six months after that initial seed round. And then so that was uh, in the very beginning of 2018. Um, and mm -hmm. then in 2018, tripled our headcount, tripled our revenue, and then recently closed a series A of, of $12 million uh, at the, in December of, of 2018. Well so, yeah, I appreciate it. 
And, and in terms of ad counts, what, how was the evolution? So on your prime seed rounds, you said that you kind of increased the ad um, counts. So how yeah. many people were, were at the you then? Seed prime round, I believe there was nine of us. So that was at the end of 2017 or like beginning of 2018. Um, Got it. At the Series A, there was about 30 of us. Um, so end of this year. Um, and then and now, now, right now it's like, it's ever changing because it feels like people are starting like every day at this point. But uh, um, right now we're about like low, we're like 42 and we're going to be 50 at the beginning of August. Got it. Well done. So a lot of growth um, going on. And uh, yeah, just to give some context to, to the audience uh, in the metrics of being able to scale only 4% uh, of all companies are able to scale to 1 million US dollars in annual revenue, uh, only 0.4% to 10 million and under 0.04% to 100 million. So typically a venture backed business, business wants to go from zero to 100 million in five, five to seven years, uh, world class standards, seven to 10 years would be also quite good. And, uh, and we are seeing some companies taking more than 10 years. And of course, as the numbers say, the majority will never even get to 1 million in, in annual revenues. So what, what's your big dream for this kind of the decade or half decade that you have uh, ahead of you uh, uh, at Powery? Um, yeah, we kind of have like two levels of big dreams. Um, you know, one is we're trying to build the largest and we're trying to build the best real estate appraisal firm in the world. That is, that is our goal. Um, you know, our, the way we are taking that approach is, and, and this has kind of been our mantra since day one is, is people product profit. So for us, it's really about getting the best people in the door. And if we have the best people on the product design, engineering, appraisal, finance, sales, all of these teams in our entire industry um, with the kind of support we have from, from the investors that we've had to date, which has been incredible. I think I hear so many horror stories of, of investor relations. Right. Unbelievably lucky to have just nothing but super supportive investors across the board. Um, but if you know, we kind of start with the people first, then we're going to have a great product. If we have a great product, then we're going to make hopefully a lot of money down the road. Um, but so our, our, our vision and our goal is to build, you know, the best and largest real estate appraisal firm in the world. And, um, you know, that's starting obviously in the United States, it's, it's a super fragmented industry. And so there's a major opportunity for someone to really come in and, and do it as, as we think kind of truly right for the first time. Um, you know, the top four players in our space have less than 15% of the market, 75% of appraisal firms are sole proprietors. And we're in this industry where there's kind of this looming problem, uh, which is that 62% of appraisers are over the age of 50 years old. And, and your average MAI, your MAI in our space is like an MD in, in the medical world or a JD in, in the legal world. Um, MAI in the United States, at least according to a couple other um, CEOs I've spoken to in the appraisal world, is 67 years old. And so for us, kind of, we see ourselves as, as the next generation and we're building the next generation of appraisers we're building the next generation of, of this kind of toolkit for the modern appraiser. And we feel like if we continue to get, you know, really amazing people in the door, then we're going to be able to, we're going to be able to get there. Um, and so that's kind of the first level for us. And the next level is if we are able to build the largest appraisal firm in the country, then there's so much expertise and data that, that we have internally, that we can then kind of potentially leverage that to also enter you know, the development world or other kind of aspects of real estate beyond just appraising um, and kind of become more of a full-scale real estate company. And that's kind of the, the very, very large vision where, you know, I think there's, there's absolutely a billion dollar company in just the appraisal world alone, but it can get a lot larger than that when you think about all the other kind of facets of real estate that we're touching on and interacting with every single day. Got it. And in, in coming back to the first version or the first step of your uh, big ag or big airy audacious goal. Um, so do you, what is the, 
what is the revenues of the largest player in this industry at the moment? Do you have those data or do you have that data? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. It's not public. Um, there's estimates, there's uh, kind of whispers. Um, the largest players are doing, uh, as far as we can tell, around like 150 to 200 million dollars a year. Got it. Got it. So, yeah, so accomplishing the the first part of your PAC means uh, kind of going through the amount of revenues that in principle would make you be able to to go public or or to keep growing, make, making it, keeping it private and, and keep growing the company. Um, and so, which means that you are still uh, super young, you are on this for the long run. So in the way that you talk about this, it seems that you would like to go to 1B. If, if, if you go to the first step, then dreaming a little bit bigger and really trying to, to move, to, to build a, a, a very large company. Because as you know, there are founders that are fine to be five, seven, 10 years, but after that, uh, they would love to get their exit and maybe having another leadership team and uh, in the company. So it seems that your dream is still, uh, you are on this much more for the long run. That, that's, that's true or that's the vision for the company and you, you, are, you are happy to do part of it and then uh, leave it to another one to do the rest. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely the goal, right? I mean, this is also, this is our first time as founders, all three of us. Um, you know, our vision is for the company first. That's, that's really where our priorities lie. And as long as, as our team and our investors and ourselves actually think that we're the best ones to be guiding us forward, then we want to be part of it. I mean, this has been the most exciting, rewarding, challenging, fun journey you know, in my life. And so um, you know, we want to be on it for as long as we possibly can. But we also recognize that, that there's people that you know, are able to people that have done this before, you know, not, not just the startup, but within our industry that yeah. can really help us along the way. And so, you know, we are very much taking the approach of having no ego and, and putting the people in place that, you know, are the best fit to do various roles. And so, you know, we've hired people that are far more experienced than us in pretty much every single aspect of, of our operations from sales, finance, engineering, product appraisals, um, and so you know, it, it's really, it's a complete team effort. Like it's, it's, it's not on just us three and we've been incredibly fortunate to have the people working with us that, that have kind of taken that risk with us and chosen, chosen to, to hop on this, on this journey with us. I'd like to go there a little bit later in, and we, we already don't have too much time. It's being an amazing um, story, but I'd like to go there a little bit later on moving from a founding team to a leadership team where I think there is a lot of jewels uh, out there and it seems that you are doing that quite, quite, quite well. But before we go there, so we started by discussing what was the story, what is the problem, what is the mission, what is the be ag for the company for the next 10 or 20 years to be really a very large and player in one industry and later in the real estate industry. Um, and now we were discussing, uh, I would like to discuss, so in order to get those that be ag then, uh, we need to be able to accomplish uh, one of the Rockefeller habits. For the ones who don't know the Rockefeller habits, so these are habits that uh, were owned and commanded by uh, John Rockefeller, one of the most successful uh, businessmen in the history of the United States. And one of those habits, it's about assuring that all the team is clear what is the number one priority for the next quarter. And, uh, and that's my next point. So how can we kind of divide all of those steps until we get to our BAG and keep people dreaming about what will be the future and at the same time, focus it on the next piece that we need to get done in order to get closer to, to the BAG. So how do you plan, how do you define what is the next big priority, like uh, attacking a new segment, developing a, a part of the product, expanding to a new city? Um, you, know, you, know, you know what I mean. So how do you define this big milestone, this big rock? for the next quarter. And by the way, it's a good timing because we are now closing almost quarter two, uh, which means that quarter three uh, is almost uh, getting in, in, in beginning of July. 
Yeah. For us, there's kind of, there's two sides of it. Like there's, there's the business priorities and then there's the tech priorities. Um, you know, we're, we're about half the company or some kind of like 40% is product design engineering, 40% is appraisers and then um, the rest of us kind of in the GNA space. Um, and so we really have to look at our objectives on, on those two different sides. On the, on the business side, you know, right now our, our main priority is getting into a new market. So right now we have one office in New York City. Um, we're operating in, in six different states, but all out of our New York office. So looking to open that new geography and, and that kind of priority came from a conversation, you know, conversations you know, internally with our investors and kind of the metrics that we feel like we need to be showing to, to prove that this is scalable and sustainable. Um, and one of those is to get out of New York and, and open a new market. And, you know, when exactly we were ready to get to a point to open that next city and, and have that become our next priority, you know. We're looking at a stabilized ship here in New York and a really strong client base here in New York and an operation that's moving really smoothly and seamlessly. And kind of, we talk about the well oil machine all the time. And we feel like, you know, we we're kind of at the point where we got there. And the next market was always on a roadmap. You know, since we started launch our actual business two years ago, um, that was always a huge priority. And we've, we've been pushing it off, to be honest, for a long time because we've been growing really quickly in New York. And um, with some of that growth came, you know, some challenges in, in, in communication and, uh, you know, having a really streamlined process. We just on, onboarded Salesforce recently, and that's been, you know, tremendously valuable for us. Um, and so we kind of now have the foundation and pieces in place from an operation standpoint, a client standpoint, a tech standpoint, um, to feel like that we can open a new market and just really kind of take the playbook we built here in New York, apply it to the next city across all aspects of our business and, and you know, hopefully have that also run smoothly and seamlessly. On the tech side, uh, you know, our focus is really on the efficiency component. And so we meet with our, our product design and engineering teams um, when we're planning our OKRs extensively. And it's it's a, really a democratized process and open conversations. I mean, it, you know, it does start with the co-founders typically thinking about, you know, what we need to build next to create greater efficiency, but it's it's a it's a total open communication with the whole company. I mean, our product team is always talking to our appraisers. Like it started with Noah and myself as the appraisers with the vision for this product, and Caesar as the engineer to execute it. And now it is you know that is all that vision and kind of what we need to build next to make our appraisers' lives more efficient and get more reports out the door, which is one of our key metrics. Um, comes from our appraisers themselves. Like they are now the ones innovating. And that's one of our big advantages we have is this really, really tight feedback loop of our users sitting right next to our product engineering team. And we only use our software internally. And so that has been a huge competitive advantage for us because we're building it ourselves. Absolutely. And it's very interesting. And you, you talk about this, about the communication issues, and this is all about the Rockefeller habits, number three which is uh, how do we create those meeting rhythms in the way that communication goes across the organization and that everyone is on, on the same page. So very, so it's, it's very interesting that you have clear what is the next milestone for uh, the company itself and for each area of the company. That's what you just described. So how do you kind of assure that you are tracking this every week and looking to the OKRs, taking decisions on them and keep the organization learning and uh, working on the feedback that you are getting from the customers, the providers, employees, et cetera. So what kind of meeting rhythms do you have? Do you have a weekly leadership meeting, uh, um, a tunnel or all ends? So how does it work today in your business? Yeah, we have a, we have a weekly C team meeting. So there's four of us, CTO, co-CEOs and our COO. Uh, we meet every single Monday to discuss various things as well as kind of tracking on our OKRs across the, across the business. Um, and then we have a weekly revenue meeting. And so kind of tracking on the revenue side, that's pretty easy. We in <laughs> Salesforce and we have right. a, of our goals for each quarter, we have a budget. Um, and that is you know, transparently announced to the whole team. We have it all hands every month. And so a lot of what comes out of those meetings in terms of how we're tracking on tech, how we're tracking on the revenue on the business side 
um, is then expressed to the whole company and they're all hands monthly. Um, and then, so kind of on the business side of things, you know, we have various metrics also like, you know, time it takes to get reports out, you know, the percentage of reports we're getting out to our clients early. So like before the due date. Um, so all that is tracked, you know, we have that tracked in Salesforce and, and we circle up weekly to discuss, you know, that and make sure we're on, on the same page and tracking well. Um, on the tech side, it's a little bit more challenging just because th there's not you know, quantitative metrics in the same way we have on, on the, on the revenue side of things. Um, and so we do have, you know, we have weekly uh, touch points with leadership from product design and engineering um, to make sure that, that we're tracking across all our PRs and um, anytime there is a threat to any one of those objectives, um, you know, we try to, to address that as early as we possibly can and, and be very, very open with each other and transparent as to, you know, if we're not tracking, you know, why, and then how do we kind of reorganize our priorities and, and make sure that we are focusing on, on the, you know, the highest priority things at all times, because in a startup, um, time is by far the most valuable asset and, and the easiest to, to kind of lose track of, so. I'm just writing it down because that's that's a very important lesson. And typically it, um, it pops up from seed to series A. Until seed, what you are, are trying to do uh, is finding product market fit. So which means that you are delaying or kind of trying to conserve cash as much as you can in order to find that product market fit, which can mean uh, life or death. When you are on series A, it's much more in principle if you already they found product market fit or still or, or at least early early product market fit you want to start on execution mode which is being really as you said the leader in the category which means that you need to speed up the execution given that the unique economics are already right and the business model is as almost all the components um right so which means that time starts being the most scarce uh, assets instead of uh, money. And I think that in terms of mindset, it is one of the most difficult shifts on the mindset of a founder and CEO. And that's why I was writing it down that time is by far, as you said, the most uh, strategic asset uh, in the life of a, of, a, of a startup. Yeah. And usually, um, and happy that you are saying that because you have raised Series A uh, last December, which means that six months after you are already aware of that. Sometimes founders have a little bit of a struggle here that they start realizing this some quarters later, which in terms of speed, they are already losing uh, three or four quarters because then they need to react um, to why the growth is not um, happening. So super, super well done. Um, uh, absolutely. Sure. That, I, was, I was gonna say like that is- yeah. That wildest things of this experience and trying to scale a company as fast as we are and you know, our peers of venture back startups are trying to scale is that like six months doesn't feel like a long time right like in, in just kind of normal life so for yeah. me like, it's like we just raised a series a like i remember that vividly it was not that long ago and yet now we're you know we have about two years runway left but um you know we're thinking about the series b and like looking to raise that in about 12 months. And so uh, how quickly things have to happen and do happen in this kind of world is, it's really shocking and remarkable. And it's, it's very exciting to be a part of it, but you have to just be constantly readjusting and be kind of conscious of that, of, of you know, in the cooking world, for example, like if you want to cook short ribs, like you typically will braise that for eight hours. And I kind of think about us as, the other option is to put in the pressure cooker and like, this is, this is the pressure cooker equivalent, right? Is, is we need to be growing and scaling faster than in, at least in our industry, anyone's ever done it. And so, you know, making sure you're tracking that and very, very conscious of prioritization and conscious of the scarcity of the time you have is, is absolutely crucial. Before we absolutely, and before we go to the last question of, of, of the show, uh, unfortunately, because I'm having really a lot of fun in, in the conversation, uh, I would like to, to go back to Rockefeller Habits number one, which is all about building and leading an healthy and aligned team. And I think this is one of the most difficult things also for founders. So there is this feeling, especially after building the founding team, that we are on this as you said in the beginning, uh, as, not as you said, as you've shown, 
and you confirmed in the beginning, for the long run. And we are extremely grateful for the people that we were able to find and building this venture with, because this is really art and these people need to be very special to be together in all the challenges that we'll be facing. But then it comes the moment where we need to start building the first leadership team or what, what I like to call the leadership team 1.0. And then it comes a moment that we need to start restructuring that leadership team to the leadership team 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. Again, as you said before, in typical companies, this might take 12, 18, 24, 36 months until you start thinking about building or renewing or rebuilding or reformulating your leadership team. In a, in a scale-up, it might take uh, 12 weeks to just change positions, bring new people uh, to the leadership team. I'm not talking to the old company. Of course, this is much more people, two, three, 10 people coming every month in certain moments of, uh, of the company. So how are you managing at this stage, this trans transition from founding team to leadership team 1.0 and potentially 2.0? I, I don't have too, many, too much data about, about your org structure at this moment. Um. Yeah, so when we started out, so we have we have four C level executives, and and one of them was our actual first hire. So it, it kind of started out with the three co-founders, and then we hired a COO right like as we closed our seed round. That actually happened simultaneously, um, and so we kind of had that initial leadership team in place, and then from there we had a really flat structure uh, for a long time, where there was different levels of experience, but kind of reporting wise, everyone reported into one of us four. Um, and then as we scaled and as we grew, like you can, you can only have so many direct reports. Um, and so we haven't hired any like high level executives to date to come in above someone and become their manager day one. But kind of within the team that we had this flat structure, we have then started promoting people to like leading teams, leading pods, um, you know, leading our product team, and then having people that they used to you know, work with as peers become their direct reports. Um, and it really comes down to just you know, having an appropriate number of, of direct reports to a single manager. Like you just get to a point where you know, one person cannot be managing 15 people, for example. That's just not yeah. efficient. There's not going to be strong communication. Um, it's not going to be strong mentorship. It's it's not an efficient way to run a business. And so, well, like, that's something that we're we're still you know figuring out every single day. Um, and it's something that we talk about all the time because um, if you don't have you know a strong org, org structure in place, like people aren't are just aren't going to get the the development kind of internally that, that they deserve and that we want to be providing. Yeah, that that's a very very good point, and uh, I saw this also also a lot of times uh, in the transition from Series A to Series B, when especially in the outbound sales channel, where the sales team is being structured, SDRs, account executives, squads per market, per city, uh, etc., per segment. And at a certain moment, you don't have enough managers to run all of those individual contributors. And you, the ads or the C-level on sales gets completely overwhelmed. The same can happen in customer success or another area. And again, to find out those high qualified managers uh, in a quarter is really, really hard. And this can delay all the execution on the business. So if I would let the audience to, to kind of anticipate some of these uh, mistakes is really to start thinking about the next leaders and the next managers that you need 12 or 18 months in, in advance if you can. And it's, it, might, it might seem crazy, but it really, it's really hard and you can't allow to have the worst case scenario, which means to hire the person that you were able to convince and find instead of what you said in the beginning too, finding really the best person for that position, for that stage of growth um, of the company. And that's it. And we, I would like to ask you a final question that is already a tradition in, in the podcast, which is if you would have the opportunity to meet John again in 2015, when you were launching um, Bower Evaluation, uh, what would you tell him? 
<laughs> uh, <laughs> this stuff is very hard. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of very, very late nights and levels of, I guess, stress and excitement that you've never felt in your life. And I think just to, to be as conscious of that early on as possible is, is really helpful. I think we've, we've all kind of gotten to a point now where like the scary moments don't, we don't let it affect us as much. Um, and I think it's important to kind of recognize that we can't control all of this and um, to stay like pretty even keeled and level headed at the same time to really celebrate the wins because it is really exciting. And I think it's really, really important to inspire you know, people in our team that way. Um, the other thing is that I would say is, you know, one of our kind of mantras here um, is choose nice, which is that, you know, you cannot always be right. Um, you cannot always be helpful, uh, but you can always be nice. And so that's, some, that's, that's one of our actual kind of the key ways we look at approaching business is just like treating people really the right way and being thoughtful and conscious always of our peers or of our clients, especially as well. Um, and that's been really effective, but at the same time, we've seen that as we scale, you know, being nice and treating each other well, isn't enough. Right. And so, um, one thing that we're now trying to be really focused on is, is how do we, how do we allow people to grow and put them in the best position to continue to develop in their careers where it's not just, you know, at Bowery that they're, they're doing great work and really valuable work, but also are in a place where they understand, you know, not just the company can grow, but, but they can grow and they will continue to improve um, in their given field, learn other aspects of the business um, that, you know, we get kind of can take for granted sometimes that we have access to all of it, right? And, and so we're learning so many different things every day, but making sure that we're putting the team in a place to also continue to evolve and develop and, and have kind of visibility in all the things that we're doing. I think in the early days, you know, we weren't great about that. And I think we're getting better for sure and being more conscious of that. But that's kind of one of the things I would, I would tell myself is, is, is start thinking about that stuff as early as you possibly can, because it really does impact every single person in the company. And it's something that the whole, you know, everyone who works at any startup is thinking about all the time. And as the, as the co-founders, it's, it's just easy to take that for granted. Um, and I think it's, it's really crucial not to. Absolutely. Uh, amazing. Uh, final point. Super, super inspiring story. Uh, John, thank you so much for joining us today. And congratulations for what you have already done. And we would love to have you back uh, as soon as you get the next milestone uh, <laughs> done. And hopefully getting you here also when you are not only at the 100 million, but at 1B. Uh, but before, as you said, there are uh, another milestones to celebrate. And you are always welcome to, to the show to compress all these it. lessons. I really, really appreciate it. We have, we have a long ways to go. So... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> great to speak again. Absolutely. So, and to our audience, thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, too. Uh, you can uh, tune in for more of those podcasts at scaleupvalley.com uh, slash community. You can also watch the episodes on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, and there is also a blog article summary of uh, this episode that will be done in the launch of the our blog in the upcoming uh, weeks. So thank you and see you soon with another uh, episode of the Skill of Valley podcast, where we bring the best tech companies in the world to compress the lessons of scaling companies from 1 million to 100 million and beyond. Thank you so much. <laughs>